Hello everybody, it's Dominic here with uh, two stand-up comedians. This is Mike Capozzola from America and Adam Bloom. I've known Adam for years, long as long as I've been doing stand-up. Almost. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I started before Adam, he's very particular about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I started, you were one of my favourites, you see. You see, what, she, no, she said when, he didn't qualify to say still. <laughs> <laughs> My that's, a, that's a typical co comedian. That's a, <laughs> the insecurity of being a comedian. Oh my god. And Mike, I've just met uh, in the last month or so. We did a new material now, which we're going to talk about. But I, I, the thing about being a comedian, would you agree, even though I don't know Mike that well, there's an affinity. I think his comedy is quite adversarial. It's us against them. Mm -hmm. We've got to make the room go for it. And I think anyone who does stand up comedy, doesn't matter if you meet them, and you don't see them for 20 years, you still feel an affinity, you still have a friendship. Yeah, and if you go abroad, comedians from the, that country will gravitate towards you to yeah. welcome you. Mm -hmm. We're a family, aren't we? Because we've all died, we've all stormed, yeah. we've all struggled, we've all had rejection. So I think that's a really nice thing about being a comedian. Brotherhood. Brotherhood. Yeah. You know, tough gigs, hard gigs, successes. Mike's from America, I've just come back from America, so Mike's been very kind to introduce me to uh, some comic book convention people. I'm doing my first one, which I'm real worried about. Who are you going dressed as? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going dressed as Tom Holland's dad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm going to go to the one in London, local. MCM London. You just go dressed as Spider-Man and say, my son's success hasn't affected me at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a lot cheaper booking. I couldn't get Tom, it could get his dad. So I'm going to go along. Oh my god, you like a Tom Holland tribute act? <laughs> well, they, they, start, they asked me, could I do some stand-up? And I was worried about the... I, I'm very particular. Mm -hmm. I like the room to be completely cordoned off, mm -hmm. quiet, the, the audience in. Can't stand people coming in whilst you're yeah. on. And these comic comms, I'd imagine, are a bit more amorphous. People wandering around and... But they have breakout rooms where yeah. there'll be a session where the, you know, they'll, they'll, there'll be an artist showing slides and stuff. So okay. I assume they'll have you sequestered. A book event, it, you know, yeah. it's got to be a... Sequestered? And what's the word you just use? A Amorphous. I've got two new words in the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> Adam's, Adam's thick, by the way. Uh, I don't very read. funny. I don't very read. funny. Uh, I love words. I love words. I have a limited vocabulary that I'm very good with. Right. You make the most of those terms. Whereas words. you have a broad vocabulary. <laughs> well, well, I don't like people who are show offs with words. Like Will Self will go on, he'll go onto a TV show, and I'm pretty sure he's gone through a dictionary before the show, and he's taken out four or five very eclectic words that he's going to use. Just three now. Elect eclectic means three. <laughs> <laughs> and why are you at the Comic Cons, Mike? Uh, I've got a show all about superheroes. I've uh -huh. been a, a superhero fan my whole life. I draw. I, that's my. That's You're kind awesome. of my yoga. Yeah, I like to draw. Okay. And um, and I, I started by drawing superheroes, so I learned anatomy. You know, everything's so yeah. exaggerated, so it's really good for anatomy. And the the show is the intersection of uh, the stand up and the love of drawing and cartoons about okay. superheroes. He's, long, he's a great artist. Yes. No, you sent me some stuff on. And how long's the show? Sixty minutes. Oh, good. So a good little hour slot. I went to a Comic Con in Arizona with Tom, and two things struck me. The mania of the fans, mm -hmm. like they are, it's like a religion. Yeah. And then how brilliant the artists were. Just everywhere there are these incredibly proficient artists doing beautiful drawings of, uh, I mean, they're extraordinary, aren't they? The, the the comic book artists they're talented yeah yeah really talented and um, and they're doing it with their hands this isn't somebody working on the computer no. I love the fact that you can look at what they I drew with the markers I think they're <laughs> yeah, with they feet help. no feet painters here no they're not they're not using software they they no. basically take a blank page and they see what they want to draw yeah which is what you know the, I do that kind of stare at it okay and you know this isn't somebody who's no 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 I have to say I have to say also quite erotic yeah. some of these stuff is like you know like they have sort of a buxom girl with a sword, and they really draw the lines in. This will be edited out. <laughs> they know their audience. They know. Well, I have to say they were really alluring. Yeah. You know. Well, if you've never got laid, you at least want to look at a picture. <laughs> yeah. But I'm going to go to London and see how it goes on. But we, Mike and I, met at a new material night. Well, I was trying to tell Adam where it was, but I couldn't remember. It was. I said it was Southgate. A working. I did that gig two weeks ago. Nice gig. Working Men's yeah. Club. Three thought. weeks ago. Yes. Yeah. Lovely gig. Lovely gig. And I heard it said. Is it your gig? Well, no, it's Gary's gig. No, but the, the Newman's Hill night. Yeah, yeah, I host it. I've done four, and they're not easy. 
Did you like New Material Nights? I love the idea of, I did one of a couple weeks ago with Phil Nichols one. Oh yeah. We just turned up with a bit of paper and looked down at my notes. I love the... The license you get. Yeah, and also I, I came off shaking because you're so outside your comfort zone yeah. going, is this funny as opposed to this is funny. Mm -hmm. but I don't have the same confidence on stage. Well, that's, that's, not, that's apparent to everybody because I go on shaking. I go, I go on to host and it's only 45 people in a room. So you think, actually, what's to worry about? Because I'm going on with new gear, yeah. I try and have to sort of mentally trick my head and say to myself, over the years, let's say the five hours of gear I've written that I've done at Edinburgh and done on telly, all stuff that really worked, it was all new at one point, and at one point, everything was fledgling. Right. Yeah, but you, drip, but you drip the odd bit in while you're doing what I like gear. Yeah, but you know, some you... of my big signature routines that I didn't know when I started doing them I've turned into these big things. Sure, but when you're doing a really good gig of your best stuff and your brain goes, slip that bit in now. Yeah. You know, it's probably because you're doing well. If you're ripping it, you don't want to show new stuff because it can knock you off your, you know, the, yeah. you go, especially the speed I talk at, you go, the audience sense something's wrong. Yeah, you're, yeah. You're stumbling on wording. So if you're, Alison McGowan always did his new stuff at the beginning yeah. because he hadn't got the rhythm going so yet. I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. No. But what I do is I do my new stuff in the middle of a gig that's going well. Yeah. So my point is you don't want shaking because you don't even know you're going to do the new stuff. You go, right. I feel confident now to try that bit. But right. new material's all new. Yeah. It it's is. terrifying. And I did, a, I did a gig that you were at, Mike, the other night. And I did this monologue at the beginning, maybe 10 minutes of stuff I'd never done before. And I was getting a dry mouth. I was trying to salivate because I didn't have any confidence in the material because I'd never done it before, ever. Oh, do you carry notes? No, I go on with it in my head, right. and uh, you know it's a, it's a it's a great feeling when something works for the first time. Oh, best feeling. But then, if it's such a good feeling, why don't we do it more often? You're on stage floundering. <coughs> your instincts, your survival instincts, will kick in, and you will go safe. You think I've got to get got to get mm. the room back. Who and then the old stuff doesn't work either. Yeah, that's right. And you go, what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Oh, it's awful when that happens. I did um, Matt Brown's gig in Kingston outside the box. It's nice, it was all new stuff and I decided if I go down, I'm going down with new stuff. And I really struggled, really struggled. Did you? But I didn't do one old bit. Mm. And Did it you? felt really good. Even though I struggled. Yeah. Are you closing? No, I was at a 10 minute spot in the middle. That's a great room. That's it's a nice room. But, it, but my point, it, it felt so liberating to have a, even though it didn't go well, and I'm t talking maybe a three out of 10, but everything I said was new. And well, that felt good. Yeah, well, it depends if you keep it in and stuff. I mean, I'm not doing Edinburgh this year. I did Edinburgh the last two years, and people have asked me, why aren't you going again? And the reason is, I haven't got a new hour. I think it's very hard to turn over a new hour. Well, you're, you're one of the most prolific comedians I know. When I was new, part of the reason I loved what you did was you'd always go on and do a little bit of crowd work at the beginning and then hit them with a line after they've got used to the idea of you just chatting. It's a very good technique, right? Because it's just, it's kind of loose, Easy. it's loose, and then boom! But it also makes the opening line, the first joke, have a bigger impact because it's like, oh, is this bloke just going to chat, chat, chat? And then you go, boom. And that was a formula, I don't know if you're aware of that, that you actually used to do a lot. A little bit of hello, a little bit of reference to what the comments talked about, and then, boom, there's the joke. Okay. And then you always did loads of new stuff. And it was always, when I saw you, of course, if I'm not seeing you for two months, you've had two months to write it, but some people, it stayed the same year in, year out. Oh, yeah, no, I can never do that. But, but back in the day, though, I used to do like, eight gigs a week and that was a lot of stage time for me to turn gear over whereas now it's much more um it's the gigs are much more seldom there aren't as many gigs as there used to be and i don't want to go out and do gigs all over the country anymore so i don't have the the facility to turn over as much gear i have still ideas and i write them down jot them down but i think i haven't got a proper gig for eight days i can try that and if i'm doing a big gig a big dinner gig in black tie you can't. No, you're no, not no. the place to break. You can't offset. Hey, sorry to the client. Yeah, you know, I was a lot of new gear. I was trying. Do you know what's funny? Here's my invoice. I, I completely agree with that. And yeah. yet, once I was doing a corporate that I was doing so badly at oh. that I did a brand new bit and it I worked. I heard about that. <laughs> but listen to this. <laughs> Isn't that wild that it, it's the opposite of what you were doing? I'm not. I'm not. This is not to contradict what you said. I couldn't agree more. However, this corporate was going so badly that I just sighed did a brand new bit, and it was the only bit that worked because there was a spark in my eye of, <laughs> rather than going, can't believe how long I've been doing this joke for and yeah. it's not working. It was, what do you think of this? And they went, it was all right, they didn't know it was new, <laughs> but something in me was reborn as I went to say something fresh. Um, but, it makes sense. Uh, oh God, the worst thing is that a corporate. 
struggling and as you're doing the bit go this bit's 20 years old yeah no. well, if, I, if I do stuff about my kids because I know how old they are you know the I know exactly how old the joke is so that's so sometimes when I'm doing a gig and I might pretend Paddy my youngest is four <laughs> he's not four I got a joke about having four cats and they're all dead <laughs> <laughs> So it, it, it's interesting what you said about I used to go on stage, do a little bit of stuff, and then go into my gear. Yeah. I get really cross now when I'm when I'm doing a set. And I'm normally normally on last, um, and then the compare doesn't do anything. It just does, no, no. The compare just does stuff on the room because then when you go on, you look rubbish. Mm. Particularly if you're opening, right? If you're opening, it's even harder. Yeah. Because he's gone on, smashed it. He's done stuff on this guy, stuff on that woman, bit of this on that. And it just looks like it's a riff night, and this guy's fantastic, and he's one of us. And he brings you on with no jokes, so you can't gauge the room with real jokes. So mm. I go on thinking, well, I don't know now. And you, do, you start doing your stuff, you're yeah. like, well, why are you talking to us? It's catch 22 as well, because if you go on carrying on with crowd work, they're um, like, yeah. we've already we've already, yeah. he knows what everyone does for a living in the front row, we've already spent yeah, no. My There's no perfect way around that. My thing is, I blast them with material, so there's a gear change of just content. And then I just grab work once I've done that. It's not ideal, no. but, but the fact of the matter is, that's the closest I've got to solving the problem. There, some people, uh, Mick Ferry goes on at the store, absolutely smashes it. And I got I said to him, he's about to go on stage. I went, could you do some material good for you? But he yeah. went, no. <laughs> it was so lovely. He was like, no. It was beautifully charmless. Yes. No. And, um, and he went on and smashed it. And you got to go on and work. Uh, Mandy Knight does crowd work that's often material. Yeah. So that's even more effective because I have to say the compare at the store is 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 key to how your geeks go. But the, but the fact of the matter is, what's these are great comics and Mandy. Uh, I did a weekend at the store recently where I probably had a nine out of ten, five shows out of five. But Mandy had a ten as a compare because she's doing crowd work that's actually material. So not only is it about them and making them involved, it's. Yeah. Crisp and not one and they, line fails. And they feel, wow, this work, this, this is a it's hard to follow. Work. This is oh, yeah, hard to follow. Yeah, so yeah. But well, Mandy, you, also, Mandy loves being there, yeah. and and most a lot of comics do the store and get through the weekend. Whereas Which Mandy, one are you talking about, Manchester London. or here or London? London. London. The, it's like a, a, a concert there with the strobe lights and the you know like get ready to rumble. Like it's yeah. the yeah. best comedy club in the world. Oh, it's phenomenal. It is the best comedy club in the world. I think the the Thursday show. It's very relaxed because it's, it's sort of start the weekend, and if you get if you if you're doing a good set at the store, the only thing the only thing I say well, it's not the best show in the world is because it's, it's, the pressure is such that you always stay safe. So for us, I think to watch a show there is fantastic, but for the comics, I personally cannot go on with any sort of sense of freedom. I'm going to go on with this is my mm -hmm. set. Mm -hmm. It's going to be 17 minutes, and that's it. Anything less than smashing it there is a failure. It feels like like that's like they're so good. Well, the audience is so good. The audience is packed, and the the, the PA is brilliant. Yeah. It's international. The stage is tiny, so everything's set up for you. So you should be able to smash the room. If you can't, then you probably shouldn't be on the stage. Absolutely, you're supposed to storm it. Yeah, you do, but I don't personally re regard it as a relaxed gig. For me, it's get on, yeah. stay on. Fantastic, did really well. I but it's still a choice. That's still a choice. Yeah, for me personally, but yeah. I reckon most comics are the same. Absolutely, but it's still a choice to put yourself under that pressure. Yeah, because it's the, it's the comedy store and Don's there watching. There's all, you know, if you drop below a certain quality yeah. threshold, they're out. You can feel the eyeballs on you there. That's the place. I feel like that, that place you can feel that you were yeah. in the spotlight. Like you feel it more than any other show where you're like, they're like, what do you got? But what I say to myself during the store is, this is, the, this is as good as it gets. It's everything set up for you. They're excited. They paid a lot of money to get in, and the stage is everything's perfect. So uh, this it's should yours be to lose. as easy as it easy as it gets. Yeah. Yeah. You're not doing a gig where there's pillars and there's right. a rubbish PA. Would you say it's yours to lose at that point? Like it's like. I think that, I think it's, it's it's an easy gig, but we sh we we tell ourselves that it's a tough gig because it's the biggest. And there is no new material. Yeah, you just can't. I I wouldn't. I I, I have if I'm. You know, because you can crush the gig, you yeah. can drop a few things in. But I wouldn't do, there, I've got some routines that are pretty safe and solid, but I still don't do them at the store. Because mm. they're a little bit, um, they're a little bit um, whimsical. Whereas there, I'm much more boom, boom, boom. I've only seen people do shorter stuff where, like, they're not telling a long story, a personal story. Like, it seems like stories don't have a place, like, you know, jokes. Carl Donnelly does longer stories. Yeah, Carl does. Well, he, yeah. he, he has that style. 
But I saw Brian Regan. Do you know Brian Regan? Love Brian Regan. Okay, so I met Brian Regan in London. Um, you talked about him at yeah, the show we did. About yeah, him. about six weeks ago, I took all my family, my four boys, even Paddy went, because Brian's so clean, right? Mm -hmm. Nikki as well. And um, it was at the, the Y Theatre, the YMCA Theatre. Is it the Y? Is it called the what? what? Leicester Square Theatre? Joel went to that. Joel Saunders went to that. The Leicester Square yeah, Theatre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's only about 500 seats there. Right. And he was so nervous, because it's his first gig in London. Mm. He plays. 5,000 seats yeah. in, in America now. He's 5,000 seat stadium or theatre comedian. Fantastic comedian. I think he's as good as anyone. And he was so nervous, and it was so interesting to me because he's he's got he's got chops. He's a magnificent stand-up, and he settled in. But I knew he'd come off the. I got away with that. He did a great set, but the audience were so there for him, and yet he was so nervous because it was his first gig in London. Why were they there for him? Because of his internet presence. Yeah. A lot of Americans were in, but I told a lot of people on my forums and platforms and said, you've got to go see this guy, because he is, and I met him afterwards, I was really pleased to meet him, but I was also heartened that he was nervous, because I see him as, as a guy doing something that I do, but on a different level. I him. wouldn't say it's a different level to you. I, no, I, he is, he's a different level to me, and I'm, I'm not being self-effacing, I'm, I'm just being, I think, honest, but I was affirmed by the fact that he was nervous, because I get nervous. I think with Brian Regan can get nervous, there's no, there's no sense of shame in me getting nervous. I, I bet he wasn't nervous on his second night though. No, he only did one night. Oh, yeah. it's amazing, the first night somewhere. I hate that, the first night. I'm a terrible traveller. When I go to Hong Kong, it's the second night I, I nail it. First night, I'm sort of, oh, jet lag, I'm tired, you know. It, but take away jet lag, even the fact of, you know, I remember Just for Laughs, the first show there because you're doing stuff you've never done in that country you're worried that there'll be one the phrase that doesn't work yeah, yeah. And, and also it's not even that it's, it's still the feeling of it's like a bubble and you're on the outside of the bubble and you do your first gig you're inside the bubble it's psychological you're, you've got the ball rolling you've passed over yeah, yeah I mean, I, I'm not you know we, we're not rolling off our CVs here but I supported Jim Jeffries in Tel Aviv in a 3,800 seated basketball sim for two nights I was petrified the first night. I bet you were. And the second night, I was at a gig. You know yeah, what you yeah. I was at a gig. Yeah. Did you do Jewish stuff? I did. No, I haven't got... My only no. Jewish stuff is about not really being Jewish. Okay. He got, a, he got a pass on the name, just the name. Yeah, it's the like, blue. Blue. Oh, blue. Like, we love Maria. <laughs> there's no doubt I got the gig part because of my Jewish heritage. Yeah. But the point is, I was terrified. Yeah, no, I forget that. that. No, I just, I've just done Dave Thompson's gigs in... Budapest? Uh, Vienna and Budapest, yeah. And Vienna was a bit of a thin crowd. But Budapest for me, even though it was a full room, was easier because I'd already done a gig abroad. I'd just done one. And I'm, I, I don't travel so well, I shouldn't be really saying this on, on a recording, but you know, it takes me a while to settle in. Even Edinburgh, my first gig in Edinburgh. You just lost the one night corporate in Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> I can gig in Melbourne. <laughs> I don't. Adam's three out of ten still worth watching. <laughs> oh, that's, oh, that's actually a nice thing to say. <coughs> I think, I, all I heard was Adam's three out of ten, like a reminder. Yeah, go to Melbourne, but it'll be a three out of ten well, gig. You know, you told me <coughs> just earlier on that um, how I used to do stand up when you started. Mm. Were you? I, I don't think I've ever told you this, but Pete Harris, who was a, was a promoter and an agent, he was my agent at the time. He, you really upset me. Because, I upset you. Yeah, but not not not, not through anything that you did. Because Pete said to me, because I was sort of the new thing in London, I was doing really well. I was you really, just won newcomer. I was heralded. I was really heralded in London. And uh, I was quite enjoying this sort of little ascent I had. And Pete said to me, Dom, you've got to see this kid called Adam Bloom. He's fantastic. He said, I, I booked him. And you're doing a show in Surbiton and Adam Bloom's coming. This kid is fantastic, Dom. So I was thinking, oh no, I've got to follow this new bloke, put out a bloody blue. <laughs> so I turned out really anxious. But I turned out it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> you, you came up to me afterwards and you said, that, that was really good, but Pete had hyped you up so much, I was expecting to be blown away. As so I said it to you. You did, because to be honest. That's not very nice. It isn't great, but the Sorry. thing is, <laughs> but the, the thing is, you know, but you prefixed it with, well done, I really enjoyed that. But then the fact of the matter is, if someone says that to you, you, you can only fare in their in their eyes. You you know if your if your I expectations guess. there, uh, even if I do very well in, I mean it, well, I remember the gig, uh, Clayton and Gordillo hosted it. Were they? Yeah, okay. and I was. This is how new I was. 
uh, um, John Gordillo applauded me on the stage as I walked on, stayed there to applaud me, oh. which is very much the new guy, here you are. Okay. And um, we had a joke overlap as well. The Nicorette so patch your, on. Your memory. I know, yeah, I know. Um, this is Rain Man, by the way. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> um, I had a joke about the no smoking sign on, on buses. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. And, but we, we went in different directions, so it oh, obviously hadn't okay. nicked you, no your joke. But anyway, but yeah, you did kind of, you're, but you can be quite brutally honest, you know, don't you? Candid. Yeah, you're kind of, someone's doing well, you're like, you're doing very well, but you're not that good. <laughs> <laughs> Do I say that? No, but you, you, that, no, that's, a, that's an exaggeration, but you, you basically came up, told me, that was good, but I was expected to be blown away. So you basically say you're not as good as I thought you were going to be. Um, I'm but, not proud of saying that, by the way. Just, just uh, that's not, uh, that's pretty quite blunt. But Pete saw me encore on a ten. Oh, okay. Well, it's interesting being a comic because I'm where you are on a bill. As much as I, I, I really admire people who can do it, I'm always hoping the person before me is going to be a bit smelly. Well, it doesn't do too well. Yeah, it doesn't smash the room or it doesn't change the room. Yeah, not perhaps, but I do think there are certain comics who change rooms and, and you don't want to follow them. You, though you want them to be at the end. Like McIntyre used to change rooms because he smashed it. You know, he used to ruin the room, didn't he, McIntyre? Yeah, my, my people are more like Ninja Benjamin. Yeah, no, Ninja is a changing room person mm. because I don't think she should compare. You see the tweet I, uh, tweet I put out about Ninja Benjamin? No. So I'd rather follow, um, what did I say? I said, I would rather follow. Uh, Who's, the, who's that, um, okay, I'm losing my mind, what's that, um, that Ron Hubbard? Scientology, I said, I'd rather follow Scientology than any adventure. <laughs> <laughs> Which is true, because I just think there's nowhere to go after her. Well also, I mean, not only is she unbelievably funny, yeah. she's also, she's got a lot of underdog going for her. She has, yeah. And you're a white middle class male. Yeah, yeah. So Don't remind him. I don't need any reminding, Mike. It's drummed down at me. <laughs> but there's, you know, you can't play on the, the same thing. No, no, on. you can't. Also, she does. Um, she also. Nia Benjamin is a black <clears throat> female comedian, and should really, I think, of all this, I've said, should be famous. She is the one who. She is really I'm like, how, how, every time I watch her, I think, how are you not a star? The only thing is because she's quite filthy. But television she might be scared. No, she doesn't. But maybe television people go, okay, this is filthy and it's unpredictable. Like it's, you know, it's, it's not go and do that thing again. But she's phenomenal. And there are a lot of women booked on television who aren't funny. Yeah, she... But she, she, is, she genuinely is, so therefore you think that's an obvious equation. Plug her in. She should be. Because she's funny. No, she's she's really funny. funny. She's amazing. She's a woman. She's she has me howling. Funny. But you know, the other thing she does is she plays the I can't write a joke. I'm thick, I can't write a joke. So then if someone goes on afterwards and with meticulous stuff, yeah, yeah. it looks like, oh, that's that stuff that... That's the stuff that people have to do because yeah. they're not... Like you, she does that very, yeah. She's very deprecatory. She's very I'm stupid. Mm. I'm not very clever. Blah blah blah. But so they fall in love with a party for they that. Love her. And then you, so you might go on afterwards being clever. Like, oh, you have to be clever. She doesn't need that. Brian, getting back to Brian Regan, he has a. It's like a, an underdog vibe. Uh, fantastic. He plays a doofus. Yeah. So he he plays the everyman, which is very accessible. Yeah. And he does it with a plot. I mean, I just think he's. I, I think he's. Underdog's a thing here. Yeah, well, self-deprecation is a thing. Joe Brand is a very famous British comedian, and she, her career is self-deprecation. She's, you know, Joe's, you know, she's a big lady. She talk about if you don't laugh, I'll fall on you. you know, we love the victim. Yeah, in. So. America's got winners, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, it, and it, 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 it. Well, Brian's a loser. Yeah. No, but as a general thing, they're very happy. You know, Jerry Seinfeld is a guy in a suit. A cocky guy. Being, being quite high status, they are. He's great, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, but oh. the thing is, America, I've watched a lot of Just For Laughs galas and they're very happy to see someone going out looking comfortable, dressed up, and telling you stories about them being happy. Yeah. We, we'd rather watch somebody failing. Yeah, surely, possibly. surely. Possibly, yeah, I think most comics, there aren't, very, there aren't many comics who are high status like Seinfeld, Jimmy Carr's high status, most comics are low status, yes. every man struggling with the world. Let me ask you guys a question. Would you say somebody who, who takes the piss out of that character, like, like somebody who, who, who comes off as high status, but it's, it's, you can see that, it's, that the cracks are there, that it's... McIntyre. I've always thought uh, that vulnerability is the most important thing yes. in a comedian. And then when McIntyre was to get, starting to get good, I thought he could never be a star. He's too cocky. He's, there's no vulnerability whatsoever. Self-assured, laughs at his own joke, like, I'm yeah, seeing a mockery yeah. going, <laughs> yeah. almost like, it's a gift, I know. I don't know where it's coming yeah. from. 
And when they got big, I thought this, I wasn't expecting this, because a lot of people were. And I, he, did, he was the exception that proved the rule, that you have to be vulnerable. Sure. And then one day, the answer came to me. Brendan Burns said, I really find McIntyre funny. I said, why? He said, I just find a posh English bloke struggling with everyday life funny. And I went, there you go. The vulnerability isn't in his persona, it's in his situations. Yeah. He's going, oh, what do I do? He's bumbling. He goes to a hotel buffet and he's struggling. So the, well, the vulnerability is the situations he puts himself sure. in. But that's, that's interesting because there's still vulnerability there, which is exactly what you were talking about. High status guy with cracks. Yeah. He's slick, he's self-assured, but he's going, I go here and I can't function. And you'll go, I've been there, there's the empathy and there's the vulnerability. And that's, to me, proves that every comedian has to be vulnerable. His is just in a situation, not his persona. He's also armed up, isn't he? He does the voices, the acting, the dancing, the camp stuff. He's got every armour, every weapon he needs. And he, I've, I always thought, because people, you know, Mike, Mike's not popular, which I think is sad because it's pure jealousy. I remember watching that kid before he was famous thinking, he's got a fantastic job. It's not 100% jealousy. He didn't make an effort to endear himself. To well, okay, judgment. but a lot of it is informed by jealousy because he's so bloody successful of course if someone's and young and good and overtaking but also he's you brilliant. yeah he's of, of course brilliant. if someone's young good and doing well at gigs people don't want to follow him like no. oh, i remember some tv recording in the comedy store somewhere oh i've got full of mcintyre as if to say it's a given he's going to storm it yeah and i've got the job of going on oh, but i don't want to follow him no 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 sure but my point is that's all the ingredients for jealousy yeah however milton jones made didn't boast Milton Jones was very easy to be around. No one begrudged Milton's success. Well, yeah, that's, that's true. But Milton's success is, <coughs> is, more, is more attainable than Michael's. And also, it took a long time to get there. Yeah, he's been at the coalface for years. I mean, McIntyre now is playing, he's probably in Cape Town today doing 10,000 people. Right. You know, they've all paid in, he's wedged up, and he smashes gigs like Kevin Bridges does. He's a great stand up. Yeah, now McIntyre would always storm. Yeah, and, he, and he, his, his three out of ten would, would love that three out of ten. <laughs> He's great. And he goes to America. I'm sure he'll break in America. I'm sure he will. Because the Americans, you know, I've just been in America, and there is this interest in our accent and our properness, if you like. I was telling Adam, any time I heard a comic, like when there's your next comic, and it's a British, it always equaled funny. British equals funny. People yeah. would like stop talking and like, shh. Yeah. And like, what is it? Yeah, I think it was a new voice. It's not, a, not another American talking about whatever. Uh -huh. Like, this is, like, it's, it's new. It's like, you know. Well, hang on a minute. What's is this? It, hang on. I've done a gig in the States. Really? Never, never done a gig in the States. Atlanta has a fun club there, the Laughing Skull. I wish I'd known you were headed there. Would have. But apparently, you can't work in the States. Apparently. Well, you would have done a guest set. You, you can't get paid. If you don't set it up with Visa stuff, this would have been either cash under the table, shh, or there's simply a, an open spot. Okay. But I, I was told that even guys going to Los Angeles, Carl Donnelly's just been. Well, don't get paid at the end of the day. Apparently, game. you even have to pay for your ticket to get into the room. Because if you don't pay for your ticket to get into the room, and you do a set, they can see that ticket price could be construed as being paid. No, that America's so strict, apparently. Yeah. Well, yeah. just one thing, though. When you say an English comedian goes on stage, everyone goes, oh. The English comedian's flown to the States to perform. No, if somebody's on, on, on holiday in, like when I was in San Francisco for two decades, you know, anytime they're like um, doing a show, whatever, and then, we'd, hey, we have a special guest, he's in town from London. Or yeah, yeah, people kind of like, Oh, okay. I felt like they, okay. like, oh, it's not another girl talking about, you know, blah, 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 or another guy talking about the, sure. it's like, it's okay. no more, but no I more think, of what we've heard already. Well, probably, I think there'd be, there'd be an intrigue, because there's a, there's a different novelty. nationality, yeah, novelty, but I think the best, I mean, we talk about, I think we talk ourselves up in comedy, because of Monty Python, and mm -hmm. I think the American stand-ups in American comedy is much better than All ours. my favorites, about my absolute favorites are nearly all American. Roseanne, Spin City, uh, oh, you mean Fraser, sitcoms? You mean sitcoms? Just, every, just comedy, the output. The rest of development. Yeah, um, the output of Kimmy Schmidt. But stand-up wise, you know, Mitch Hedberg, Doug Stanley, yeah. Neil Hamburg, I don't know if you've seen him. Patrice O'Neill. Patrice O'Neill. Um, who else? There's, there's loads more, really. Paul Regan, there's Bill Burr now. You know, there's Louis C.K. I mean, I used to work with Louis in London, and he was just a, just doing the comedy store. Patrice O'Neill used to do the comedy store with me. I know Patrice quite well, actually. I knew him quite well. And I used to follow Patrice, and it was not a problem at all. And then he just became this titan. And you watch him now, and it, it, uh, that's a clever comedian. Oh, it's great. The elephant in the room is a, a phenomenal uh, hour of comedy. Unbelievable. Yeah. And the way he was so nasty to people, <laughs> mm. but with a sort of 
uh, enough of a smile to, 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 to blunt any of his bars. Yeah, yeah, that grin, that little gap tooth grin. So he was so, such a brilliant stand up, but he wasn't brilliant when he was doing the store, he was just a regular guy yeah. from America. And so was Louis. Louis C.K. Wasn't, wasn't anyone to worry about following. And then he got, this, he got the anger, didn't he? he? Got the acid, and then that became his thing. I know he's had his downfall now, but yeah. you can't take away his. You well, can't he take, achieved a lot. No, you can't take away what he did. He took it as far as you could want to take it. With some, with the freedom that he had yeah. to do his thing, you know, I remember them calling it like a post Louis world, not not into yeah. that scandalous stuff, but like you know, we're in a post Louis world. Do it yourself. I like the fact that I've worked with him. I worked with Eddie Izzard. I worked with Lucy. Lucy came, came, came to see me. Lucy came, came in Kilkenny. He specifically he? came to watch me gig. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. he's a nice guy when I knew him. I've not seen him for years, but I think Patrice O'Neill is, is is as good as anyone. And and off stage funny as well. And he'll hold yeah. court like you bet eight of you having dinner, and he will say every word. <laughs> it's yeah. an unbelievable personality. Yeah, he's great. Last Mitch Hedberg, never met him. Did you meet him? Yeah. Well, I met him very briefly, and he looked off his head to back say like that. So this is Adam from London, with that, uh, like that. So that when was my was that in America in ju just last ninety eight. Okay. But the point is that my moment with him was five seconds long. I've seen him perform twice though. I, I saw mean, him. In, I never saw him. Saw him in Kilkenny, and I, he was amazing. And I, he walked on cold, just took double header with him and Jim Owen. He had a rucksack on that he kept on the whole time. Did he? And he had two cans of beer on the stage for his half hour set. He opened one, drank it, and, then, and drank the other one. It's always like, this is half an hour's worth of alcohol. Right? <laughs> um, and the second time I saw him was in 2005 in Montreal again. And he had to follow Sean Cullen, okay, from yeah. Cool Game yes, Juice Mix, yes. so who's a Canadian, amazing comedian, singing. Yes. This is an American in Canada oh, wow. following a Canadian singing, and Sean smashed it, absolutely smashed it. And they, no, please welcome Mitch Hedberg, no MC, just an announcer. Oh, and he just went, Hi, put me on after the Canadian guy singing, thanks. Right? Got a laugh for that, and then smashed it even more yeah, with right, just words. Yeah. Rocking, mm -hmm. looking up like that, and I just went, Wow, that's, a, that's someone who has complete conviction in his material and his persona. He looked like a rock star as well. That oh, helped. He did. He looked fantastic, and because uh, he did the because he, he did the drugs and rock and roll thing, that just added to his, uh, you know, his uh, allure. Poor bloke. There's a clip of him I saw when he was doing all good material, but he had no sunglasses on and he walked back and forth. He paced mm -hmm. a bit, yeah. and it had no there, nothing like evolution. the impact. There's an evolution. Yeah, yeah because the glasses help. But the pacing is like, why are you walking over there? You, he's going. This is my material, and I'm going to stand still, hold the mic, looking up the glass on, and rocking a bit, and it gave it so much more weight. Mm. The cell just shows the cell, the wow. image. Because pacing slowly, glasses looking at the audience. Honestly. Have you seen that movie, Comedian? Joe yeah. Seinfeld. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an amazing movie. I tell you. I, That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. The fact how nervous he was. He's doing, is he doing a big room in London shortly? I don't know, but he, yeah. he, got, nothing, he got nothing to a joke. I know, he got nothing, and he was doing gigs, and he was sitting backstage and asking for selfies. He go, not now, because you can see yeah, his yeah, terror yeah. Yeah, in his yeah. face. And I love that, because that's Jerry Seinfeld. How many episodes That was at the made? DC Improv, there was a kid, that was my friend Paul, he said, can I get a... Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So, and he said, not now, and he, he was terrified. That's a great room, that was at the DC Improv, that was a great room. I worked with Mitch Hedberg at the DC oh, Improv. Oh, right. did you? Yeah. My, my favourite moment in that, I think was when he did a joke that got nothing. This is Seinfeld in New yeah, York. Yeah, yeah. In New York. In Long Island. And a woman in yeah. the audience, an English woman. You know, I think, I heard, it's yeah. really weird hearing an English accent in America because yeah. you're so used to the American yeah. accent. It sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? And she went, Is this your first gig? Yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> and he went, Yes, this is my first gig. Like, okay, you got me. He, all he could do is repeat her heckle. That was a brilliant. <clears throat> so vulnerable. Yeah, so vulnerable. And, and he could be anywhere in the world doing whatever he wants on a yacht in the Caribbean eating the best food, and he's choosing to try material out, and it's failing. He's there in the most but horrible for, situation. But for me, I cling to that. Because that, that new material you made the other night, I, I can glean from that set a few little ideas I think probably yeah. will work. But when I see someone as celebrated as him, that for me is very um, um, useful. I just met some kid at a, at a show who didn't even know who he was. It's very funny that he's so young big. Stuff. Yeah, it was, it was like her first gig, and we yeah, were chatting, yeah. and, and, and uh, we'd gotten on the subject of American comics, and, and uh, I brought up his name, I forget the context, like, and she's like, Seinfeld, Never you know, the show, Seinfeld. I don't, know, I don't know what kind of world she lives in, where as a no. comic, she hadn't, even if she doesn't know... She hasn't like Seinfeld so much, the sitcom. 
I found a little bit um, indulgent. Oh, I prefer to sit up to the stand up. Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The stand up was so economical. He just, he just only used the words required. Yeah, yeah, sure. Which I really enjoy. Then and I, like, I like people who shout. A lot of comedians now shout. The more I shout, the laugh funnier it is. I don't think that's the case. It's, it's, is, is it funny? And Seinfeld was all stripped back. Yeah. Beautiful observations with, with a bare minimum number of words, mm. which is, I think is a real skill. He makes well, them come to him. Well, there's that lovely bit where he's talking on that talking funny with Gervais and um, Chris Rock and Louis C.K. and Seinfeld. And Seinfeld quotes the Louis C.K. joke about when he goes on a family holiday, there's uh -huh. screaming kids. He yeah. says, you know that walk when I shut the car door and I walk round to my door? That's my holiday, <laughs> right? It's great, right? <laughs> and and uh, Louis C.K. went, well, you know what? You've actually just rephrased that joke. And you, you're such the ma maestro that you've managed to condense my whole bit to one sentence. So basically, Seinfeld it, it unintentionally reworded it to the minimal words. Isn't that great? He's quoted him better. Yeah, than, no, so, uh, that's a yeah. gift. I'm, I'm a big fan of Jerry Seinfeld's stand up. I think it's fantastic stuff. I mean, you know, and there's Richard Pryor. Uh, we, we've got great stand up. But, uh, you know, Eddie Izzard is a, a peerless comic. You know, Brave as a Lion. You know, and uh, Connolly was fantastic. Yeah. Sean Locke's my favourite. It's also when they list off your TV credits in your introduction, which I would never have in a club, but a corporate's good. Just go, okay, I haven't heard of him, but he's. Adam, I've not been on TV for twenty years. Uh, oh, my my buzzcocks, uh, <laughs> my buzzcocks credit is nineteen ninety nine. I never did buzzcocks, but I'm often credited as having done it. Oh wait, but the, the point I'm often credited as Perry nominee, and I've never been nominated. For it, but I don't mind. Some, some people, lies you don't mind. Some people come to me and say to me, uh, "I loved you on the Parkinson show." Oh, you did Connor, didn't you? Yeah, we've done Parkinson's. Des O'Connor, right? I've done Des O'Connor a few times, I've done Clive James a few times, but Bob Monkhouse mentioned me on Parkinson. Good old Bob Monkhouse. Oh, lovely. Because Parkinson said, who should we look out for? He's the Jew. And Bob Monkhouse said, the person to look out for is Dominic The Monk. The person? Yeah. That's great. Yeah, that's lovely. So that's my, my, my representation on the Parkinson show. Go to but it. a lot of people say to me, you on the Parkinson show, fantastically funny. Did that's good. <laughs> but, but my thing is, when they are... The, you know the, the foot soldiers as you say and they I go on with some TV credits they often I feel them going oh great we're lucky enough to have someone off the telly in front of us and the the big 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 people nobody impresses them by what they've achieved because they've achieved more so I see it slightly differently it could be let, let's be honest something is how you choose it to be if I if I go on acting confident because I feel like they're real people and I can relate to them, then I'm going to have a better gig because I've decided that. You are choosing not to be intimidated by their success. Yeah, I mean, I'm never, I'm never intimidated by success. But do you see what I mean? It, you have a good gig because you've decided you're going to have a gig to those people. Yeah. It, yes, you have the technique. Of course, you have the technique to, to say... To a point. Yes, you have the technique to go, I'm going to be a little guy. You know what you're doing. You know what you're doing. But you've still decided before you say that line, that you're going to have a good gig. We can talk ourselves out of gigs, can't we? We can go... We can, but I have a little technique that I try and tell myself every time I do a gig. I have, to, I have a little routine, so I can't... I have a very set routine before a gig. Which is what? I've got to be alone. I've got to, I can't be chatting like I am now and just walk on stage. Right. I need to get my stuff together. So you get a little mantra going? Yeah, well, not a mantra, but I just need to get my stuff around my links. And uh, I would be talking about... At the comedy store dressing room, I always come on from the back, so I'm in that little black corridor place and come off from the side because I just get to get my head around it. In a court for I would be remembering my three jokes I've written on the company. That's what I'd be doing. You only write three? <laughs> <laughs> I do about 12, 15, riff out, just go on a riff with them. <laughs> I used to follow people when I do corporate gigs one of my first questions would be who did you have last year and my nightmare would always be Monkhouse because I say yeah we had Monkhouse last year, God you know he's supposed to do 20 minutes 50 minutes and it was all on us. I think oh, Are you House. serious? Yeah, Monkhouse was amazing. He was a great man, lovely man, a brilliant comedian, very maligned in his life and now celebrated now he's passed. Which I think was a really unfair. A lot of the policemen, comedy policemen didn't like him. But uh, there are comedians who you like to follow in corporates because you know they're not very good. They've been on TV mm -hmm. and you know they're You're not very good. <laughs> I know they're not very good because they just have to be the right demographic. They're the best comics to follow because you know they didn't do very well. It made me think of this, and this would be a good question to put to you guys. Like we we all have something we don't uh, like. We have like our, our like I hate that. There, there's now we're seeing people who don't know how to play an instrument or something, but they want to have they want to keep their 15 minutes of fame going. Like 
I think I'll do stand up and you'll have wow. people who can instantly headline a room like it's that kid from that TV show. All oh, right. Like you take any sitcom kid who's had stuff written for him his whole career. Give me an example of someone. Um, is this Americans or British? Stormy Daniels, the porn star, was doing a, oh. a stand-up tour. This is a porn star. Wow. I'm sure she doesn't write her jokes. I'm sure the jokes are horrible, but she's going to sell out. Oh, so she's just making some hay while her. Okay. It undermines the art form, doesn't it? It does. It happens in the DJ world. You get these girls who are really good looking. They'll dance behind the decks, and they're just playing. Up, they'll borrow somebody else's set list and put it on a memory stick, and just play off a memory stick and just dance behind the decks. You go, okay. You know. I I don't fully appreciate what DJs do, but well, I, I understand. I, 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 but I understand that a good DJ has skills. They're curating something. They they, they still yeah. have skills, otherwise there wouldn't be a hierarchy system. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is, it's undermining stand up just to think, oh, I'll have a go at that. Yeah, I'm I'm well known and I can talk. And, and they're not writing their stuff. There's somebody no. like the manager is going, give me that kid who can yeah. write. Or oh, they are writing their stuff. It's not very good. I'm just kind of just go back one second to that story about the. Um, who you're following at corporates. I don't just veto it, I give them an introduction to say, because I've had this. Well, this this guy's had his own series on Radio 4, but is Radio 4 funny? You tell me. <laughs> it's a horrible thing to say. Right. One guy, I said to him, what are you going to say about me? So after that, because my finger's burnt, I said, what are you going to say about me? He said, we're going to say we had a really hard year, so this is all we could afford. And I went, you're, no, you're not. You're not. I said, you're going to say this. And he went, but I haven't got any jokes then. I said, you're not doing the jokes. But no one would introduce a band. Right. No one would say, right, we're going to have dinner yeah. now. The chef's awful. But they're, they're rubbish, the comedian. They would yeah. never say that we've got this woman singing here. Yeah. Uh, she's rubbish. For some reason, they think comedians are... Because heckling's part of the culture, they think making fun of you is part of Before that. you come on. Before you come on. Leaving you with See, a disadvantage. Firstly, mm -hmm. I think I would enjoy that. No. Because I think that gives you... License. Um, yeah, it gives you license. If you say something funny, and then, you, and then you can sort of ref him. Funny enough for you now, mate. Funny yeah. So you, you, you clearly you like being low status when you're brought on. I am low status always. Right. Okay. I don't want them to go. It. it it's for me. It's first of all, it's bad man. Guys, listen. We're gonna wrap this up. Um, Mike, thank you for hosting. This is Mike's lovely flat in North London. Adam, let's do another twenty years in comedy, mate. Oh. And it's been really good fun, lads. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, so. I, I'm going to get this edited um, by one of my lads. I can't do any editing. But it will be online shortly. And um, thank you very much for watching. And Mike Capazola, catch him in London. And Adam Bloom, catch him all over the country. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Cheers, Mike. I might be all over the country. <laughs> I was thinking that. I was thinking that. I was thinking that. You no, can't. Yeah. Can. Mike's hard to catch. He hasn't got many gigs. <laughs> that was a bit Alan Partridge, that was. <laughs> Right, I'll stop it now. Brilliant, guys. Thank you very much.